a debt service is just a, a shy of 12 cents there. Before they, we go forward, mm -hmm. is there any governmental underwriting of these bonds? Does the state kick in, protect them, or anything like no. that? No. You know, if you're, um, we have a triple A rating. It took us the whole life of the city to become triple A. And what that affords us, we've had rating agencies that have come looked at our, our operations, our long-term financial planning, long-range planning, debt planning, and have rated us about our consistency in, in paying our debt. Um, that is the highest rate you can earn as a city. That's oh, Fitch. That's good. Fitch and uh, S&P. We, we, we use two rating agencies. And so what that does, um, back to your kind of your question, because we are AAA, we do not need any underwriter insurance. Used to, we did carry some insurance, not by the state, but a, another agency that for a fee, if we should be in default of making those payments, they would step in and make the payment for us to the bondholders. But we haven't used debt um, insurance in many, many years. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit during that economic downturn back in 09 that some of those insurance companies went belly up and did not uh, mm -hmm. uh, did not, not pay. Company that was available. Yeah. So if you wanted insurance now, it's very expensive, hard to find, but um, and the cost would outweigh mm -hmm. um, sometimes how much you could uh, uh, just go ahead and, and staying with an unrated uh, position in your debt. But but with AAA, that uh, it, we're very happy with that, and that in turn keeps our borrowing cost extremely low. Because if you're an investor and you're over here, okay, I could buy this double A bonds, there's a little more risk associated with that. So I better get a little more interest on my investment there. Or here's the city of Louisville, triple A, very safe and everything. We can actually say in the marketplace, no, we're not gonna pay you that interest rate. It's gonna be a little lower because we're less risky mm -hmm. than that entity over there. And so it affords us a lower cost, which in turn keeps the cost of some of you know our projects and our capital down. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. How often do these do these change? Once a year we have the opportunity to change these rates. Every year we um, when you are mailed your uh, property tax uh, statement that says, you know, for the coming year, your last year's value was this, next year your value is this. There's a time period where that's being assessed. You can appeal those type of items. Then later in the fall, that you get that in January, or that's, that value is set January 1st. Then later in the fall, we get that information on what that value is to the city. We take a look at that times our current rates and our needs at the time, and we determine, can we keep our rates the same? Can, do we need to raise them? Or can we lower them? It's totally a council decision at that point on where they can put that rate at. Have they changed from last year? Because my property taxes we went down. They went down? They did. They did. Yeah. Yeah. went down taxes. at least seven, eight hundred dollars Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Property taxes is, there's two right factors now. there. We could have kept the rate the same and your property tax could still go down. So there's the rate can right. either go up or down or your valuation that your house value could have gone up or down. So those factors determine whether your actual tax bill is lower this year or higher this year compared to the prior year. Oh, okay. I'm I'm right. Is there a state mandated ceiling? Yeah, it's like two dollars and fifty cents, I believe, on a city. So you can see we're way below that, and I don't know of any city that's hitting that. Mm -hmm. um, no. Yeah, and state law will not let us go over two dollars and fifty cents total rate. Okay. This year, the council kept the debt rate flat, and the O and M rate actually decreased. Mm -hmm. That was a, a recommendation by staff to keep that debt rate flat because, as Brenda will tell you, as she goes through the presentation. That debt rate is going to determine the amount of debt we're able to sell over the next um, 10 years. So it was important to keep that flat. Yeah, they knew this committee was going to be meeting, and depending on what you decide and recommend, uh, we don't want to artificially lower that and, and then hamstring you if if you would like to see it uh, go up a little bit for to afford some projects or something. So, yeah. Which one is that? The O&M? No, the I.S. 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 That, that, yeah, that 11732 was kept the same. Is it a long that there's a certain limit that the city of Louisville can go as far as bond? Is it a law like you She's going to get into that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's we, a law. She's going to tell you. She's going to talk about capacity. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So in comparison, like I said, that we compete with other cities around um, the area. We've taken a, a few cities. We have a, 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 some survey cities we'll take a look at and compare ourselves to from time to time on various things. And here you can see our tax rate comparison. Louisville is second um, to the lowest when you look at our total tax rate. The INS rate is in red and the M&O, O&M rate uh, for operations and maintenance there is in black. And that's not new. We've been second to the lowest for yes. a number of years. Yeah. Wow, what a grapevine. Yeah, it just for... It's called Hotel Motel Tax. That's about the is same. that what it is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So why is that? Yeah. 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 Hotel Motel Tax does yeah. that? Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot higher percentage. Was that the game yeah. over? Yeah, sometimes the makeup yeah. of the town can tell you a lot about, you know, maybe they have revenues yeah. in other areas that help support stuff, them yeah. and they can keep it lower. Other ones may not, may be really dependent on their property tax and it's a little higher. Another ratio we look at and looking at other cities is the debt ratio. It's the debt as a percentage of taxable assessment property. You're just looking at your total property, uh, taxable property in your city, and you're, you're comparing your debt amount to that. And as you can see, we're about 1.57% right there in other areas where, you know, this is very, uh, very common, except for Garland, we're all within that one to, to a little over 2% there. Grapevine didn't make this. Uh, grapevine should be on there. Well, I don't see it. Good question. Yeah, it should be there, but. So you can tell their INS rate is the biggest portion of their overall tax rate from the chart above. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would assume they would be a little bit higher up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be on there. And these are 2013, 2014 figures. 2013 figures. These are right here. No, the, this the is tax rate. This is from our last audit. Right. The tax here. rate comparison was 14, 15. The rate tax rate is 2015, 2014, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, <laughs> yes, uh, you know that's that's an education piece. You know, when you do look at your tax bill, we are the entity with 44 cents as a tax rate, and your school districts will be uh, around the two dollar figure yeah. or something. Yeah. So, it's a different. So, some components of bond size. When we look at bonds, you know, we also we're looking at the timing of the projects, where the needs are. You know, when when are they needed? When are they? Um, you know, a component of uh, bonds or the size, you know, how big of an issue do you want to do? How many, how many bonds do you want to issue a year? Um, there's a, you know, a rate of debt service that we have a debt policy on. We pay off our debt within 16 years. So we, uh, we sh that's our amortization schedule. It's 16 years. It's proven, I don't know how many years it's been that way, but it's, it's been a very, very strong, and, and we believe it's a, it's a good, it, it's, a, it's aggressive without being, you know, we might as well just pay cash for this because we're paying it off real quick, yeah. but we're not, not making it last forever to where you're paying for things that we built 30 years ago or yeah. something. Yeah. So. How does that compare to the region? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Are we. I think, I think we're probably more aggressive in that. Uh, you probably have a lot of cities that average around 20 years, so it's not going to be more common. Yeah, I will. I, I'm curious to know too. I've never, uh, I've never checked other cities. What do other cities around? Oh, by how many years? Gina okay. makes a good point too. That is another uh, source of uh, information from you is our financial advisor for Southwest. If we could bring them in, they would know that type of information. That's what they do. They, they're in that market. Yeah. I like it in particular if we're saying six years and the average of other communities are 20 and we go out to make an argument that we need to pay off the debt and because we want to do some major things in eight or ten years, we're still half of what the average of, of our competing, competing communities are. Yeah, we can get that. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm just looking at, I've, I've looked at this chart and it says, you know, Garland, I'm just looking at Garland and they're paying a ton of debt service, but they also have a huge debt ratio. Yeah. So what did they do that we need to not do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got really old. 
Yeah. So if have a record. I'd say that denominator, the, the taxable yeah. assessed valuation, the bottom part of that calculation is probably not as big, you know? I uh, mean, Garland is an older community. They're electric utility. And the electric, oh, like, yeah. They own their own electric utility. Oh, no. Is that a bad thing? Well, that's not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. But it, oh, okay. they always get money in. Oh, okay. Okay. I have a cash no, cash. Just a cash. We don't need a cash. And they can charge anything. Okay. So today we're talking about. Oh, and just to finish that slide, uh, the other components. There's also prevailing interest rates. That's information. You know, it is what it is. What interest rates are out there when we sell our bonds that we can command in the marketplace. Uh, we have a certain tax base. Uh, we make projections on that, but it is what it is. The property values usually have been going up, but you know there is a certain level that it'll go up and uh, and no more or something uh, from year to year. And you know we have to look at that total rate, the components of that. We have an O and M rate that needs to support the general fund, <coughs> that public safety component. So the difference between that. What we need in, for general operation and maintenance and the total rate is the debt rate. So you've got to have a good marriage between those two that you're not um, not having enough for maintenance and operations, but then um, you can still afford your debt service. So the authorization here that we'll be uh, asking the citizens for are for general obligation bonds, and they do require voting, voter authority. Certificates of obligation, obligation do not. We've done some certificate of obligations, but usually, as a general practice, we usually go out to the voters and get their opinion and have them vote on our bond packages. The only time we use certificates of obligation is when we have a very a dedicated source. So when we've had uh, a 4B sales tax, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little while, uh, we sell certificates of obligation against that 4B sales tax. We also used uh, certificates of obligation for your art center, and that's against your TIF revenue. And I think Gene is going to talk about that. Um, while we may ask the voters for that upper limit, how much how much bonds can we sell over a, a, a period of time? You know, the other thing is the. Um, when to sell will always be a decision of council. So they vote on those issuances every year, or if we're be or if we're selling every year. But whenever there's time for a sale, they will vote on that. The general, the attorney general's preference, though, is once you have a, a the voters have spoken and they have approved a certain authorization that you have to spend or you have to issue that authorization within ten years. Uh, it's just kind of a general preference that they like to see that being spent. So the time frame we're presenting to you tonight is a 10-year window that we want you to look at. We really pushed it during our last sale. <clears throat> what uh, our bond council told us was you just need to keep talking about it because our program uh, in the end is a 14-year program uh, because we had other sources that came, became available to fund those streets. So we were able to stretch out those bond dollars for more projects. Uh, but we did that. Every time we went to a council retreat, we talked about the fact that we still had that authorization. Mm -hmm. So that was an important fact. Mm -hmm. uh, voter approval you know, of that bond package, along with council's decision <coughs> to, um, to decide on the timing, creates that flexibility with a capital, uh, capital project uh, program. Uh, when something happens or uh, we get new funding, like she said, some priority, priorities can be shifted and some things can change and everything. And that's that's always a good flexibility to have with the two groups working together. Um, and it can be used, g general obligation bonds can be used for any public purpose, um, street, drainage, public safety, and parks. We alluded earlier to that land banking and what that is really more of an economic development type of focus. And that's what the Attorney General and, and Farmers Branch um, discovered, I guess Farmers Branch discovered, is that that's not really deemed by the Attorney General as a public purpose. Mm. Um, so it, yes, it's more of a private purpose. You want to take some land, you either want to make some money off on it, or you want to keep it long enough for something good to go in there. And it may be all a good idea, but it's not something that's really should be used for geo bonds. So we're going to talk here in a minute about where land banking money can come from, but it wouldn't probably be from the GO bond program. Man, you're using soft language. 
mm -hmm. the Attorney General's preference, mm -hmm. maybe we shouldn't. Yeah. Is it mandated it, or is it suggested? There is no law, but what he does, he, he sends out letters of his opinion. Yeah. But you know, it is a voting type of office. So the next Attorney General may have a different opinion. So you just pretty much have to go with the current opinion, and um, that's kind of how we, on, on, on these issues, we kind of just direct ourselves to. So they weren't ever penalized or fined for what they did? They just were told they couldn't do it again. Oh, just, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if you look at the Attorney General's office uh, in relation to the, the, the time or the, the lack of the authorization, um, I would tell you that uh, that's, that's something that's, that is pretty hard rule. It's, you can't go, it gets back to people voted with the expectation of a project to occur. Mm -hmm. And if you wait 20 years from now, it's just not logical that you truly have that support of the public. So if you think about it logically, uh, there's, there's a, a good basis for that uh, type of review. Does that make sense? Yes. But when they did it, did they wait that long time, or oh, did I, they? I was actually talking about two different issues. I think he oh, went okay. to the time. The timing. Yeah, of the timing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. If he suggests ten years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Also, a bond authorization should be worded in general terms. Like example, you may suggest that we go for X amount, millions of dollars for streets. It wouldn't be worded as X a million for this a, this specific street in this neighborhood. And, the, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there's you know other sources of revenue over those this, these 10 years uh, that we're talking about that could become available to, to use. And so you're gonna want to, if the county's gonna give us money and help us partner with a building of a road, you definitely wanna take the county's money and use that, not go and and issue debt just because you have told voters that you are going to spend that money for on that road. Um, another reason is if, if you have it specific, like we want three, you know, three million dollars was voted on for ABC Road here, and it only took 2.9 million to build. You've now wasted a hundred thousand dollars of voting authority mm -hmm. that can't be used anywhere else because you made the specific promise That's that right. three million would be made, would be spent for that road. Talk about that a little. Uh, last week that that gets to the heart of not only what your bond ballot uh, looks like but also all your marketing material so when you uh, develop your marketing material you'll see us say things like uh, suggested streets could include and you'll have a list you're not locked into a specific mm -hmm. list of streets you are locked into a dollar amount mm -hmm. And our supporting material, um, like she, besides of that, it, it must be factual only. We can't have supporting material that says vote yes, or we we think you should do this. Mm -hmm. It will just be factual only. But it could say that there was a road. You could communicate whatever safety concerns that it's, it's not. It's factual because of increasing these this statistics. These statistics say this. Yeah. So educational. Yes. It could be so educational. It could seem like it's pro, but it's really just factual, yeah. which could lend to itself to the argument that we're trying to make. The, the, the city staff can't, but a separate group. Yeah. So we're going to be showing you a couple models, a, a couple of numbers to throw at you. Uh, uh, as we talked about, our financial advisors for Southwest, they um, issue millions of dollars every year in this bond market and for various cities not just us they they work in this industry and are very knowledgeable of what bond issues are going what the rates interest rates are what conditions are supporting a good bond sale as opposed to when to sell and when not and so they help us with those decisions and they've helped us build these models there's some assumptions that they use there's the tax base growth we all don't have uh, a, a for sure crystal ball that tells us exactly what where the tax base is, but we look at our prior history and we look at what we expect the future to hold, and, and we try to be conservative though to make sure that um, maybe we maybe we've had a history of a three percent growth, but to assume that it'll always be three percent growth is unrealistic. A city has a life like anything else, 
there's the there's the period where it's just growth, growth, growth. You know, land, a lot of uh, unused land. And then there's a period where there's a maintenance standpoint. There's not as much land available, and then you you know a, a, a city matures, <coughs> and uh, and that growth is a little bit different at that point. Uh, there's also interest rates to make that assumption. And again, we use First Southwest on this. They're in the marketplace. They know what interest rates, and they know about our AAA rating. And in historically what we've been able to bring to the table as far as an interest rate out in the marketplace. They also know our current policies, um, you know, and we want to maintain those. We want a 16-year debt service because that's what our current policy states, those type of items. So given some things we know for sure, <coughs> we have some debt, outstanding debt right now, mm -hmm. and that has to be continued to be paid over until it is paid off. So they factor that into it as well. Can you, you might talk a little bit about our, our current existing debt and also educate them on Castle Hill's debt? Yeah. The current, our current um, debt that we have that, uh, that is going to be similar to what the, the citizens will be voting on is, is called general obligation debt. It's also called direct obligation. It means the city's full faith and credit is behind those bonds. We will do whatever it takes to, for those bondholders to be paid. And that's roughly right now, it's uh, currently outstanding about 90 million. Of that 90 million, 20 million is being paid by other sources. We have um, some bonds that was converted to GO bonds in a refunding from, and our water sewer uh, revenues are paying for that. And then also some 4B money is going towards some of those bond payments. So net, we've got about 65 to 70 million outstanding right now. That are, that's currently being uh, serviced. Uh, now we have other bonds that are associated with our name called from the Castle Hills development. And those are not direct obligation bonds. That means that they are paid directly from contract revenues of the Castle Hills development. So there's an assessment out there. There's a property tax that is paying for those bonds. And should that ever not be enough to cover their bond payments, then property owners will be assessed and will pay any difference in those, the difference between the debt service and what the property tax does bring in. But they've been able to pay their debt service with just property tax. The assessments have never been um, needed for debt service payments. I think it's important that you understand that when we get to a point, if we get to the point of an election and you have opposition, you may hear people try to talk about our total debt, including Castle Hill's mm -hmm. debt. Uh, and Castle Hill's debt now is over $100 million. Mm -hmm. It's close um, to 200 million. Mm -hmm. This is Castle Hill's, this area. Uh, back in 1996, it was brought into the city's ETJ. There's a development uh, agreement with Bright Industries. Uh, as this area developed, it split into water districts. I'm just going to give you a really high-level explanation. As it divided into water districts, the city came in and established public improvement districts. That public improvement district, the city's public improvement district, issues the debt, so that's why it has City of Louisville name on it, but it's the property tax rate of the people who live in these water districts that retires that debt. Mm -hmm. It is not an obligation of the City of Louisville. Just in that area? Mm -hmm. Just it, it, that it, green area? In green, green area. area. Okay. Yes. Almost 200 million. It's almost 200, 200 million. just shy. They they had some bond issues this year. They, the, you know, there's some that's for those of you know that area. Some have been built for. Uh, it's been around since yeah. what the the mid 90s. Yeah. They just now started on some building of some areas. So that you probably saw some dirt moving if you've been out there. So there's a brand new area that's starting to be built up. And so this year they had some bond issues that that brought them up to that level. But you know, we talk about our 44 cents rate, tax rate. That has nothing to do with that. None of, not one penny of that pays for anything there. It's only, they have a separate property tax, a separate assessment, a separate um, billing, so to speak, a tax bills that go to them that uh, pay for that debt. So they're not going to vote on these, on these bonds? They will not. They will not. They're not residents of the city of Louisville at this time. Yeah, that's okay. what you remember when we, talk to the 2025 committees uh -huh. yeah. about uh, the big uh, move of new neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, that is future Louisville. Mm -hmm. As their uh, 
debt rate drops as that debt gets retired and it gets closer to the city's debt rate, mm -hmm. uh, then the city can actually begin annexation of that property. And when it was that that area in um, Hebron or city of Hebron, Hebron, Hebron. Mm -hmm. county of Hebron. Sorry. At one time, it was all county of Hebron. Okay. Uh, just recently, we annexed property along Josie Lane. How many acres, uh, Eric? Uh, 160 yeah. acres. Uh, right along Hebron. Um, that's actually in the city of Louisville proper. Now. Really? Uh, that'll be on the next agenda. The annexation's done. And we brought in 250 single-family homes in that development. Is that the right number? It's about 525. 525. Okay. I was half right. <laughs> so that's not considered Castle Hills. That is the city of Louisville. Yeah, the city of Louisville. As is Austin Ranch. Austin Ranch, yeah. So now, um, their property values, are they included with the city of Louisville property values? Because I, I know someone asked me that. They were wondering how how was our property values that high? They must have been including the Castle, Castle Hills, Hills in. No, so they're, they're not, not included. None of those? Okay. Okay. Not in any of our figures. Now, whoever you were talking to may have included it, but not in our figures. Okay. Yeah. And in the annexation we did recently, there, there's no debt associated with that. They just, that land just comes in, and then once it develops, it adds to our property value then. Mm -hmm. um, so. What's the property value that can be annexed in, in sections? Or no, it's all or nothing. I'm so sorry. It's sections. Sections. Okay. Castle Hills, can it be annexed in it sections? It can be. Uh, it's, you know, districts. <coughs> so it okay. can be the debts issued by districts, and so it can be annexed in by district. As they so, clear yeah, up as, their debt. As okay. 1B, that debt was sold back in 98. The first debt was sold uh, in 98. And as that debt has, has gone down, they become closer and closer to a, a potential annexation where okay. G and H... That's all brand new. Wow. And Brenda, their tax rates, I'm going to sound confusing. Mm -hmm. Confusion is a lot of those people have a Louisville address mm -hmm. or, or zip code, but their tax rates range from less than a dollar, uh, 98 cents, 88 cents. 88 cents, right. 88 cents to a dollar. Almost, yeah. almost double what the Louisville well, rate is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Louisville provides fire and police protection. Mm -hmm. They do that contract areas? with us for fire and police. They do pay us for that additional service. Uh, we actually also provide wholesale water north of 544. North of 544. I have a question. The 65 to 70 million debt, I, I mean direct obligation that we have, do we have, how many years left do we have to pay on that? It varies depending on the issue. Uh, our oldest, I think, is 2005, so it's looking at paying off. It's a 16, okay. so it'll be paid off in 2021. Because okay. mm -hmm. um, remember, your, your debt is issue, issued in tranches. Mm -hmm. So when we went to the voters back in 2003 for a general obligation program, $64 million, $64, million, 68, 68 million dollars like in up. debt uh, was approved. <laughs> But that was issued around five to seven million a year. Okay. Uh, and so every year, five to seven million gets issued, and then that 16 year clock starts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it would never be, if we went to the voters, say, like this year or beginning of, uh, I mean, well, 2015 or beginning of 2016 and are in May, will it be incremental or will, yes. uh, even though we'll be asking for a lump? Uh, we we'll still be million. issuing it over time, over, time. over a ten-year program. Okay. Yeah, they'll vote on the lump sum, but yeah, they issued it. Okay, so if I could get, just make sure I understand this. Sure. The figures we've been presented tonight include no Castle Hills properties. Not correct. Whatsoever. <coughs> no. So we are looking at that half of the map. Yes. <laughs> yes. Plus. Well, plus. Plus the other parts. Plus Austin, 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 Austin Ranch. Right. Okay, so that's where those property now, values versus debt. And now, and those and now, Josie, and now Josie Lee. Okay. Although the figures we've got here doesn't have that. Sure, because uh, it's Because it just has it. Just yeah. Okay. It'll be in your 2015 figures, because that's when the value shows up on our tax roll. Tax roll, yeah. And the, the name, the, I'm sorry. Look. No, the, the Josie part, there, that is unoccupied at the moment. Mostly, it's, it's bare land. It's bare land. It's bare land right now. Is that the same over there where 121 is? 
Um, I saw this some homes going up for the three hundred thousand. Is that Capel or is that us? That's actually us. If I correct about so what I think you're talking about, that yeah. would be the two Murdad projects, Wendell, what's in Could it be. Yeah, it's up there just west, just west of Castle Hill. Oh, so I go there. Oh, uh-uh. No, it's no, over there. About, she's by us, by, by Capel. Oh, yeah, oh, I think it's oh, over yeah. there. Yeah, over there, by the, over there behind the Walmart that's on 3040, yeah. right there. It's As right you're going into Capel. Oh, so okay. it's right across from Mr. Yeah. Probably this big piece here, that's Capel. Oh, that's Capel? That's not us? Everything on that side is Capel except... Yeah, one that's section. That I'm guessing, but if there's, see, yeah, there's a big going like in here. Right so, yeah. across that if you're heading north right on 121, north. like you're coming out of Capel, it's going to be on your left hand side. It comes from the 300s, but it's past the Louisville well, sign. Yeah. You are talking about right. Denton Tap and. Yeah, because there's that Wally Road right over there. Right before Round yeah. Road. Right before Round mm -hmm. Road. You're talking about Denton Den Tap, and that crosses yeah. History Ridge. Is that Flower Mound? No, no, that's no, not flower mound because it's this side of 121. Y'all know where the Walmart is on 121 and 3040? Yes. It's right. It's Here. like you're heading towards down into Capel. Come down the tap. But see, that's Louisville because it's way yeah. past the sign. It's this, way north. Yeah, there, there no, is a housing development in I think Louisville. She's talking about under construction now. Yeah, they've oh, moved yeah. the dirt. They just have the sign up there, it's homes on the 300. Street. Those are townhomes. Are those the townhomes? Yeah, I, I thought they were single. Those are townhomes. So that's Louisville. That's not Capel. That's, that's Louisville. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, no, I thought you were talking about. I'm right across from you. There's development going here. It's mm -hmm. Which would be Capel. Capel. There's something coming in here in Capel. There's development in Louisville, south of, of the Walmart. We have there. several townhome developments. I could have sworn they were houses. They said they're houses. No, no, no. They know what you're talking about. It's right. Market Street's up here, the Walmart's up here, and it's in between the two. Yeah, Market Street's down yeah, here, and there's Walmart's right over here. Townhomes. Those are townhomes? But they're nice and they're, they're like, they look like those Mercedes homes. They haven't even started building anything over there. They just got the sign up. There's nothing built over there yet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. There's one going up right now. It's just dirt. They just have the brick wall up, and it's got the brick wall up, and it has a sign. There's no homes being built over there yet. Yeah. It says homes from the 300,000. So I don't know if that was Louisville uh, there are or Cacao. Contract revenue bonds. Contract. So, okay. Okay. so I'm going to point out two, two new uh, significant yeah. residential yeah. developments yeah. up here. We're going to go up north if they default, to 121 no. And, no. And, no. And, and business 121. Because uh, here's 544. Oh, you regular 121. Uh, there's, there's a large townhouse development. Uh, attached and detached going on on either side of Cookie Lane and either side of the tracks up in this area. This is City of Louisville. It's called Wind, Wind Haven Junction. Right. And total lot count is five, six hundred on either side. And they're, they split the size of the track. They're townhouses because it's kind of a buffer between the main lanes of 121. You have a storage facility that's in Castle Hills to the one? east. Uh, you have what was the what, what was townhouse detached townhouse in Castle Hills, so this is called a Windhaven Junction, and this that. is another uh, Centurion development, and um, they're going through the planning stages now, so they'll be pushing dirt probably within a year. Do we have an estimate how um, if how much the base will increase in the next five to ten years? Um, yes, in fact, that, that was the support behind some of these uh, models I'm getting ready to show you. Okay. Um, what we did, um, it, I'll, I'll get back to that and I'll, okay. I'll give That's you a figure on that. Um, on here, here's, a, here's an example of our debt service rate history in this next slide. You can see right now we're at that just shy of 12 cents. But if you look back several years, we've been uh, a lot higher in the wow. past. We were. So, yeah. If you look at uh, 0203, you see a debt rate of 0.134690. Mm -hmm. When we went to the voters uh, for that bond election, what we told the voters was you could sell that bond package and your debt rate would never exceed that 134690. And it never did. In fact, it went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need something like that this time. Yeah, That's so the plan. Yeah, we need to say something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And
And here's our, a look at our prior bond programs. As you can see, uh, over the years it grows because the needs are growing and, and things cost more as well, too. You can see that 2003, the last one was at the, the 68.725 million is what the voters approved. And, and off to the right, you can see that's when we made the first issue and when we did the last issue. So you can see there that we've stayed within. Uh, the earlier years was five years and, and toward the end of the years, we try to maintain that 10 year ratio there. Um, that's supposed to be a slide. I don't know what that is. Before <laughs> it froze up on it. You guys have it out in front of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He just got an extra slide in there, I think. <laughs> it may have frozen, and I don't think the flash drive is in there. Is that mine now? Mm -hmm. okay. I wouldn't be able to grab it if you had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just carry it with me. <laughs> I didn't see a computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a cast of heels. Two back here. <laughs> I don't like that spoon that bad. I know. I have fun trying it with a new slang. Break time. Break time. You said break time? Did I say it? Break time? There we go. Is it break time, Ray? No, we're going to keep pushing through. <laughs> Staff's getting right on it. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting close here, right? Okay. I've only got two hours after. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I got up at 4 Don't yeah. make us all yeah. suffer because yeah. you got before. <laughs> so here is, uh, like I said, we talked about the 68 million. And if you want to look at the makeup of the last bond program, the 2003, you see we the voters approved. And again, you can see how generic this is. Street and drainage, 64.27 million. A jail facility, 3.115 million. And public safety training center, 1.34 million. It's kind of an interesting decision on that because what we had wanted to do was to have two uh, items on the, the ballot. One would have been streets and drainage and the other public safety. But the uh, AG's office actually came back and told us that we had to specify one as a jail facility. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes we get opinions. That's why we're a little soft on our... Because right. <laughs> sometimes we get something that went, uh, okay, wow. this time around. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about some of the assumptions we've put before you. Um, along with our financial advisor, we have got some, pro form or some uh, packages for you to look at, two scenarios for bond issuances. We assume a 2% tax base growth, um, and I can give you an exact dollar figure on that if you want, but, but based on our tax base we have now, we are assuming a 2% growth over the next 10 years, your 10-year window, and then flat thereafter. So, so when they, we decide on the, the type or how much debt we can issue, we want to make sure that we can service that debt in that scenario with a 2% growth for 10 years. But if our debt rate stays flat for the next for forever and ever, then we want to make sure whatever debt we've issued within those 10 years can be paid off. Mm -hmm. The previous 10-year growth here at the city of Louisville is at 3.27%. So we think the 2% is very conservative. And based on, we also look at what's going on around the city and available land and also get information about, just as Eric talked about, some of the growth that's on the ground or going to be uh, growing, and we take that into consideration. We want to make, in this scenario one, we're maintaining our current tax rate, if that's, if that's your recommendation, at that a little uh, shy of 12 cents. And we've worked with our financial advisor, the present interest rate right now, and again, we, we, we estimate on the conservative side, it's four and a quarter, and it, in 10 years, that 5%, we uh, may bump up against that, so. And again, those a little higher than what we are experiencing right now, but again, trying to be conservative. The 10-year program would start in the spring of 2016 and we'd issue through 2025. So looking at that type of assumptions, you can see on the next slide, those are those incremental uh, tranches, as Donna mentioned, that we, would, we could issue in. And that would give us a good steady growth and a good steady projects and be able to complete projects along the way. 
you see it's at roughly in, in the seven to nine, uh, 10 million range there for a total of 77 million that can be afforded over the next 10 years of projects. That's keeping your debt rate the same. The scenario two assumption, we're still staying conservative with our tax base growth, the tax base growth, the 2% over 10 years flat thereafter. But should you decide, you know, let's, let's, let's increase the interest rate, the debt service rate, the INS rate, one cent beginning in fiscal year 2017. So it'd be just shy, it'd be from that 11 cents to 0.1273, just shy of 13 cents, keeping our interest rate the same. A 10-year program would give you, would afford you 89, a little over 89 million in uh, bond issuances that you could do. And we can run different scenarios. Yeah. Different, whatever, whatever. You Didn't want to overwhelm you, you know, and get direction from you on which direction you might want to go. So that 13 cents just takes you back where you were in 2003. It's not it, so it's not. Yeah. Right. right. It's a good point. Good point. It's it's not like it's the largest rate right. uh, right yeah. we've ever mm -hmm. had. We gave you some information in your packet last week that shows you the city of Denver is about to hold the bond election, and they are actually uh, recommending an increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll we'll see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've been at 11 cents. We've been at 11 cents when? Paper. Since 2008. Many years. Yeah. Yeah. I skipped some years there, but it's yeah. been 2008. from that 21 cent, it steadily has gone down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, and that's the bond, your bond options there on those two scenarios, kind of the range of uh, total potential projects you could fund using general bonds. So I think we are, do I continue on with this? Or do you have any questions, yeah? You said that's the range, so that's? On these two scenarios, that's where you're looking either at 77 million or just a little over 89 million. Should you decide there, and, and like I said, there's if you want us to run other scenarios, we can do that. But that gives you some idea of the ballpark of where you're at as far as being able to fund uh, projects uh, for that value. This is two percent um, increase in the tax base over ten years includes those new areas too. No, no it does no. not. Okay. But it does not include Castle Hills. Okay. And it doesn't include anything that's not on the tax roll today. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's existing property projected to increase. What if we have another 2% per year? Correct. To the tax rate that was in 2002, 2003. I'm sorry? What if we got back to the tax rate that was back in 2002? We could run that for you. If we did, uh, that looks like that would add another, what, half a cent or a little three quarters of a cent. And so that would definitely increase the 89.19 to some mm -hmm. amount. I, I it have to run the numbers pretty for low in that tax rate comparison with other yeah. cities. I mean, that mm -hmm. still keeps us very. Uh, How much do we need, anyways? How much do we need? It depends, for one it depends on what we're going to do. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Let's just go to the max. What was the total? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What was the total? I think it needs to stop. Depends on what you want. What you want. Yeah. How good a sales girl are you? Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to share with you. So, back in 2000, what was it before? The last. Uh, bond committees of the last committee. And you'll see that they were appointed in 2001 and that sale actually occurred in 2003. The reason for that uh, time differential was because the council uh, looked at the overall projects along with the Blue Ribbon Committee and said, let's look at another source. Of and we stopped and we went back and uh, we actually had a full sales tax election. That election did pass in 2002, and all of the all of the projects that were related to parks and library were taken off that geo bond program and funded through 4B sales tax. Mm. Uh, and so, um, one thing for you to keep in mind is one thing that was told to voters at the time that the 4B sales tax was done uh, was that this is a dedicated source for parks projects. So there's going to be a decision point about how many parks projects might you want to include uh, in a uh, geo bond election. Now we're going to tell you what the capacity of that 4B sales tax is also because we've had 
two major uh, bond programs, certificates of obligation, sold against uh, the sales tax, the 4B sales tax, and I think Gina has all of that information. So what we want to do is, as we look at all of the different projects that the departments have looked at and, and are suggesting that you consider, there are other sources of revenue, uh, and Gina's going to paint that picture for and the ones that I'm going to go over tonight aren't a total of all the funds that we have in our city, but they're the ones that would directly be related to projects that you're going to be looking at. So many of our funds have specific purposes and things that they can be used for. So we'll go over the ones that are relevant for your discussion. The general fund is basically what most residents think of when they think of property taxes. Brenda talked about your O&M rate. That's what goes to the general fund. 33% um, approximately of our general fund is funded through property tax. And then sales tax is right under that at like 32%. And then we have the rest as other, which include fines and forfeitures and um, franchise taxes and parks and rec and, you know, just a multitude of others. So as a city, we try to have a diverse revenue stream in our general fund that kind of keeps that balance out of a third, a third, and a third so that we don't become overly reliant on any one form of revenue. So we're going to be talking about the general fund here. Um, another thing Don, um, Brenda brought up was our AAA bond rating that we're all super proud of. Um, but one of the things that our AAA bond raters look at is our fund balance. How much money do we have in all of our funds? Um, this year, our council actually approved raising that reserve requirement of what we keep in our fund balance from 15% to 20%. And that just goes along with the practice that we've had. We've actually had a practice of keeping a much higher fund balance than that even. But they wanted to make it um, more of a policy so that our bond raters and the people that review our, our debt can see that we're very consistent and we're serious about keeping that a high balance. So right now, our projected fund balance at the end of the current fiscal year that we're in, which would be at the end of September, is $12.2 million. Our recommendation is that you look at this for land purchases. And I think Brenda got into that a little bit, kind of because land purchases really can't be purchased with a lot of other sources. Mm -hmm. So this is one that really doesn't have as many ties to it. You can use it for a lot more purposes. Um, but we also want to caution you against using all of that because it's also what we use to fund technology improvements mm -hmm. and other smaller kind of capital needs every <coughs> budget year, grant matches, things like that. So just so you know, that's an, an option for you, um, and it's at $12.2 million. For example, this last fiscal year, the property that's along corporate and Valley Parkway, uh, which is some of the prettiest property that I think is left in the community vacant, we did purchase that uh, with our general fund uh, undesignated reserve. I think that was a million seven fifty. so that's a, you know, you can go through that pretty quick. So we're, we're always a little bit protective of that fund balance, but that is in your discussion. Judy, you might talk about the animal shelter that was actually funded through. I, I don't recall exactly how much that was. 4.5 4. 4. 4. million? Yeah, 4.5 million to fund, totally fund the animal shelter that we have out there now is funded through fund balance. We also funded a portion of this building through fund balance. So mm -hmm. we do use it on occasion. It's planned, and we try and keep that. Um, in the financial plan for the next five years, what we're going to use that fund balance for and don't just spring things on our city council or on the bond raters. This 5% increase, what dollar amount did that represent? The 15% um, is right at about 14 million. Well, 20% is at 14 million. So, it, it, again, it didn't materially affect anything because we already had a fund balance of $30 million. You know, you have the requirement of $14 million and then another $12 million. Okay. So it's really just semantics of what we're saying. Okay, well, now we're not going to use that. We looked at all the other cities that are AAA bond rated, and we saw many of them have that 20%. So we decided to make it a formal policy, even though we had historically maintained high regions. And I will just point out that you know our annual budget in the general fund is about $70 million. It comes into the general fund and goes out of the general fund. And so um, when you're looking at $12 million, you know, that's not as dramatic of, or large of a number as you would think in comparison of a $70 million annual operating budget. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. 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 Th
keep that in mind on the general fund. And that's all I had on the general fund cash. Is that pretty good? For you? Um, the 4B fund was what we we're going to talk about next, which is what Donna was just talking about. The election in 2002 um, allowed for a quarter cent sales tax. And so right now, when you go to purchase something at a retail establishment here in Louisville, you'll pay 8.25%. This chart shows you the breakdown of how that works. 1% of it goes to the general fund, which makes up that $24 million of the $70 million that we have to spend in the general fund. And then we have a crime control and fire services that each get an eighth of a cent. The city of Louisville 4B fund, which is what we're talking about, gets a quarter cent. Your DCTA gets a half cent. And then the state of Texas gets the whopping 6.25% of that. <laughs> so in accordance with that election, we can only use 4B sales tax dollars on parks and library projects. So that's law. We can't mess with that. We have to prove that's what we're doing. And we keep it separate in a separate fund. And we don't use it for other purposes. Is that time out? No. Like, no. for 10 years to maintain that? No, no. It, it's different. Our crime control and fire services have a five-year re-up election, but we don't have that with the work. And that's what we most recently did, right? Like uh, two years ago? Is that about it? 2011. <coughs> okay. Great. It was the end of 11, so it went into effect in 2012. In 2012, okay. That's what raised it to that. So in the 4B fund, we did um, issue debt, as Brenda told you, uh, a 2004 issue, which was really for our aquatic facilities that you see out there and the library expansion that you saw. And we also purchased some land out of that issuance for parks. And in 2007, we did another bond issuance, and it was $18 million, and that was for Railroad Park. So that athletic complex out there was a huge infrastructure improvement for us. Those payoffs are in 2024 and in 2032. So we can do future issuances out of the 4B fund, but not until these are paid off, because right now all of our revenue is really going to support the debt and the ongoing O&M there. We have a little bit extra we'll talk about in a second, but we really can't do another bond issue until after that first payoff in 2024. So if we're looking at a 10-year process here until 2025, we might could issue something in 2024 or 2025. Frame. Council rule on that has been if we use uh, 4B debt to build the facility, then we actually operate it also with 4B debt. Mm -hmm. okay. And the fiscal year projected ending fund balance that would be for this fiscal year is $8.2 million. And that's after the operating reserve, which we just talked about, that separate from what we have in the general fund. And then approximately 500000 is available each year to also go towards a capital program. So right now we're bringing in about 700000 more than we're spending in the 4B fund. 500 of that we feel comfortable you could use for a capital type program, and that will leave another 200000 for smaller items or any kind of buffer against a downturn in the economy because it is sales tax funded that's volatile. So we want to keep some kind of a cushion there. But so you would have about 500000 annually to go towards a capital improvement program. So this chart shows the um, 2016 through 2025 plan. If you wanted to fund cash, you have your 8.25 in excess reserve right now. You also have the half a million annually, which brings you to a total of $12.75 million over the next 10 years in cash. If you also wanted to go in and as soon as the debt is paid off in 2024 for our first bond issuance and issue more, you could issue up to $25.93 million in 2024. So that would bring your total up to $38.68 million that you have between a cash and credit type approach to funding parks and <coughs> library improvements. Say that last sentence again. So you would have the 12.75 in cash, and then if we decided to issue debt in 2024, we could issue up to 25.93 million and still have their revenue to cover that debt payment. And so you have a total of 38.68 million to spend on parks and library improvements over the next 10 years, if you wanted to do a, a combination of cash and credit. Only parks. Only parks, parks. Only parks and libraries. Because when we were taking this issue to the voters, the state law changed. 
and we were able to actually get a change to that legislation before it was approved. Uh, they actually removed the, the approval for what's, what's called learning centers in the law. And learning centers was how we were using 4B funds to fund the library. So uh, we were able to go to the uh, to Austin and say, okay, if this if we're able to hold this election at this time, we would still like to be able to include learning centers, and that was approved. Any future 4B issuances would not be uh, us usable for libraries. So with the with the just a general bond can you use that on parks and libraries too or does it have to be a general bond you could we've issued bonds for park facilities in the past prior to our getting 4b so there definitely you could do that okay. um, our council I think has had a preference at this point to since we have a de designated source of funding for parks and libraries to try and do that first okay but yeah you could so that's 4b um, the next source of revenue we'll talk about is our TIF fund, which is the Old Town Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone or Tax Increment Financing Zone. So you see it as a TERS or a TIF sometimes. This was a special taxing district created in 2001, and it captures the increased property value that we get from buildings that were existing in a district in 2001 and sets it aside, and it can only be used for that district. So the Old Town District, and I think... Steve was going to point that out to y'all if y'all aren't familiar with the boundaries of it. Eric, do you mind? Is it right here? Yeah. That's kind of right there. Basically from 35 Main uh, to back the to the road. Road. What's this here? Purnell to the east or to the south and then College to, oh, to the north. So within that area, we can only use TIF money to fund improvements within that zone. Um, we do have current debt that's issued against this fund, and it's the MCL grant that you see there. That was funded through the TIF fund. It was um, issued in 2007 for $8 million, and we have a payoff in 2027, which unfortunately is outside of the 10-year window um, that we're kind of looking at right now. So um, TIF debt would not be an option. Um, also, right now, we're basically bringing in about 600, a little over 600,000 annually, and debt is at 570,000. So almost everything we bring in or is being used to pay for that debt. And the debt does increase annually. So we really don't have any room to fund any operating out of there or anything until the debt's paid for. The plaza, did it come out of this funding? No. No. Yeah, the only thing it's paid for is the grant for the theater, right? Right. Yes. 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 And this district can be funded through other sources. Yes. Okay. Fact is a good example of that. You know, that's funded through the general fund. It's a, it's a grant. It has a little bit of 4B in it. I think it has some escrow money. We've kind of compiled everything we can to, to work on the plaza, but that's definitely a, a lot of other sources that okay. went into play there. So stormwater. This is an interesting one that we've been talking about things that we already actually collect and have funds for here in the city. Uh, stormwater drainage fee is not currently collected in the city of Louisville. So what we've done is larger drainage projects have been funded through our GO bond sales in the past. Smaller ones are funded through the general fund kind of annually. Um, however, a stormwater utility could offer us another revenue source to fund drainage activities. And those can include um, improving drainage in flood prone areas, improving the existing storm sewer drain system, constructing any new drainage systems, public education, and then O&M of any kind of stormwater improvements that we have going on. Um, state law does allow the establishment of a stormwater utility. And we've discussed this several times over the years with our city council and we've had public input all along the way. The first time I think we remember, recently at least, was in 1992, talking about it. And then we talked about it again in 2011. We talked about it at the 2012 retreat with council. In 2012, we actually hired a consultant to work with us on establishing a stormwater drainage fee so that we could take it back to the council and say, here's kind of what it would look like, how it would affect people, what it would, um, and we'll go over that a little bit more. And council actually said, you know what, we like it. Let's work on it. 
bring it back to us, and let's see if we can go and implement it. What we decided to do between then and, and now, though, is wait and talk about it as part of the blue ribbon because we felt like it was kind of a source that could be used for some of the drainage and street type drainage issues. And we wanted to make that kind of a comprehensive look so that we had it all in one and had it some um, education to you and kind of your thoughts on the stormwater fee. So we've decided to put it back into this process as part of the blue ribbon. But it is ready to roll. It is ready to roll. And what we have as um, 16, out of our 16 survey cities, only us and Carrollton do not have it. At least 55 cities in the state have a stormwater utility and charge a fee for the service. It would operate a lot like our water and sewer fund in that it would be a separate fund and we would be required to analyze the cost of providing these services and develop a fee to cover that cost. So it's a lot like a water sewer rate structure. Can you tell me what that is, stormwater drainage? Is that the little... You know. It's the runoff that's created through impervious surface. If you put in a pavement road, water is now diverted instead of sinking into the ground. So we're looking at trying to decide a way to use that impervious surface to actually create a fee that if you have a lot of impervious surface, you would pay a higher fee than somebody who just has a vacant land who wouldn't pay any fee. Oh, okay. So it's really based on the type of um, runoff that you have. Okay. In fact, our fee recommendation was a $4 fee for residents would be a flat fee, $4 for every resident uh, monthly. That would be adding them to your trash pickup stuff or? It would be, you would see it on your water bill. On the water bill, okay. <clears throat> so and flat fee no matter how much surface you cover or not, is that what you're saying? On residential. On oh, residential, <clears throat> okay, gotcha. On commercial, it would actually be that same $4, but we would apply it for 2,800 square feet of impervious surface. Okay. So if you have a huge complex like a mall, mm -hmm. that mall would pay a large, a much higher rate than okay. somebody who has a small. That's where it's variable rate. Okay. And there would be some variable if, if the cover was, let's say it was cobblestone with stone uh, with the <clears throat> like permeable paper. Yeah. Yeah. If it's permeable, then it's not considered impervious. So okay. there are some um, gray areas when you talk at gravel and, you know, we kind of get it's still into a hard surface, but right. it's not like it's just raw land. Right. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is cities, a lot of cities don't get into this. We felt that this was the more fair way to do it, equitable, but some cities just go off of, of water meter sizes. Yeah. And they have flat rates regardless if it's a, a million square foot building or a 50,000 square foot building, if their meters are the same, they just charge it per meter size. So a lot of cities didn't go to the trouble to <coughs> map out those pervious and impervious areas and battle out compacted gravel or compacted dirt and treat it the same as asphalt or concrete. So uh, you'll see a, I'm not gonna say a wide range, there's really two ways to do it. This is the more equitable way we feel, but a lot of the cities just go off a meter size and they have rates per the water meter size. Is Flower Mound collecting this fee? Yes. Is Highland Village collecting yes. this fee? Was it ten dollars? Is the school district paying this fee yes. to them? <coughs> the school district does pay this fee. Yes. The school district does pay to this them, fee. but not to us. Uh, they don't have one. But oh, to, us. to That's okay. Point. To the other community. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 the school district pays it where it's applicable. So, okay, wait a minute. So they have a lot of impervious. The school district pays this fee. Because they have a lot of parking lots. They pay it in the cities that charge the fee. So in okay. the Louisville School District, you know, that's located in Flower Mound. They're right. paying that portion for Flower So their citizens don't pay that fee then? It comes from the school, school Flower district. Flower Mound budget. does. Okay. But we're paying, paying into the school district. Into the school. I was going to say, are we double paying? I know. Because yeah. we would be paying into the school district and paying a fee. Well, no, wait, listen, in some way we're paying into the school district, which is then in turn giving our tax dollars to Flower Mound, our tax dollars to Highland Village, our tax dollars to Plano, our right. tax dollars to Frisco. Well, I'm saying once this, is like that she said, this is rolling. <clears throat> so once this takes effect, will we pay, be paying into the school district and a fee? Yeah, but you're yeah. paying the school district now. Yeah, I know, yeah. but that's but like I said, and if he, so we'd be paying twice. That's, mm -hmm. that's like comparing no. it to our property but tax. Yeah. The back side of that is there's a lot of impervious service in Louisville, the Louisville proper, that school district property. 
Yes. Just think the bowl and center alone. It's a yes. lot of parking lot. I'm sure it is. So with that, in my opinion, we are subsidizing with our tax dollars these other communities, and we are not getting our fair share of the pie. Well, I understand that, but like I said, I just wanted to understand the more the, the structure of paying, not where it's going. So I wanted to understand if we're paying into Louisville ISD, and, and also whenever this is enacted, we'll be paying a $4 fee for the same service. Correct. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. That $4 is for your, for your property. property. Your property. Okay. And then what we're paying in Louisville ISD, that's for that's everybody else. That's that's okay. That's just your property tax bill. Okay. Obviously, they have an operating budget, and if they're paying this fee to Highland Village or Flower Mound, that's part of their operating budget. But you're also paying for salaries, teacher right. salaries, a lot of other okay. things, too. So. Yeah. Like I said, I wanted to know what, what's going out, not right. what, is, what it's going for. Directly out of your pocket. Right. Just that $4. Okay. Yeah. That's what I want. There's a, the school district's not going to charge you a store. A right. And that's what I'm saying is yeah. the I, Louisville ISD, when I get my property tax, when they increase it by $4, no, and then no, I get no, another $4 fee no, 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 no. my, my no, water bill. Only okay. a city can charge a store water. Okay. Okay. Now, and I want to also ask, I see it said the increase 25 cent each year. Will it ever be a maximum or that's just... Yeah. Well, that is that set. Six twenty-five is the. Was yeah. that the top? Yeah, figure? six twenty-five. That's 25. at the end of ten-year period, but then and, and right. we eleven have to go years, right fifteen years. Fifty. I mean, I think it just—it's a rolling twenty-five cent increase until okay. you know. That's what I depends on what projects we get done, how we fund them, what okay. happens. So I think it's just oh, a plan okay. for to keep it. We don't want it to be stagnant, and then ten years from now. It's oh, like and I agree. I, I just looked at this and it said at end, and really it doesn't end. It keeps going. But again, no, this isn't in place. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anything could happen. This could change. This rate could change. Council could decide to go with a different rate. But this is the proposal on the table, basically. At the, okay. At the but as it stands today, the city of Louisville has expenses related to stormwater and drainage. Correct. And we have no mechanism in place to capture specifically for that. That's That's correct. Correct. For that. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Do we have? I guess we have to yes. research. I doubt we have any idea. What we would be collecting yes. from? Yes. Yes. From this, we do. Mm -hmm. it keeps us. Um, well, let's go to the next slide. The next slide. Sometimes people have an argument. Well, it's like, why don't we just raise our tax rate if we want more revenue? You know, why would we do a separate stormwater fee? Or how would the effect of either raising taxes affect people versus implementing the stormwater fee? So this chart is something we pulled out of um, a retreat document that we gave to city council. It still shows our rate at 44 cents because that's what it was when we took it to council and we haven't changed this since then. Our rate now is the 43.086. But basically this shows you that if um, a typical single family home at being 153,000, if we charge the stormwater fee um, in 2016, they would pay $48 a year. If we raised um, the property tax rate enough to generate the two million three thirty three that the stormwater rate would generate, we, that same single family home would end up paying fifty three dollars and seventy eight cents. Mm. So that's just a, kind of a quick comparison to kind of say, you know, it, it's another way to get revenue. And if we were to raise rates, which we certainly could do, that would be another option. Obviously, if we're talking about taken to the voters and increasing our tax rate, you're basically saying, what if we did that, we could increase it. So that's just a way to say, it's a more equi equitable way if we're actually looking at impervious surface, and it's a little bit cheaper. To I was gonna say one might be easier to sell than the other. Mm -hmm. So that's what this chart does, but then we get to your question, right? Um, in 2016, we would think it would raise 2.339 million, and that would grow annually um, based on the 25 so increase in rate up to 3.6 million at the end of 2025, and that would give us a total of cash at the end of that 10-year period of 29.97 million. Oh, that's not bad. Now, can this only be spent on stormwater? Correct. Okay. Basically, you'd be funding it's. Now, this for residents and commercial. I'm that there's always Correct. something. There's always something drainage related. Uh, there in the is budget. an option though too. Every, this, the I mean, fund can actually do debt as well. And so we looked at the second scenario you see there, as if what if we wanted to issue debt um, 
we could issue um, 18.295 million in 2016 to really get a jump start on stormwater and drainage and let people see we're out there doing something, a bang for your buck immediately after passage of a stormwater fee. If we wanted to do that, the debt service would be 1.6 million a year. That's again doing the same assumptions Brenda gave you earlier on the geo bonds. Um, so your cash available would be 15.571 after you made your debt service payments. So you would have a total of $33.8 million in that 10 years. So that's versus the $29 million, which isn't a huge difference. But, it's significant. but it does get you $18 million day one. Yeah, yeah. And so that would be an option for you to look at. Do we have something that we need the money that quick for? And a recommendation, I think, from this committee would um, be something that the council would like to see if you decide you want to recommend that. So that would go towards them. But yeah, it would be a council decision. One thing I just might add, I don't think he was at the last meeting. Uh, David Stocks is here with us tonight. He's our public works director, and uh, David, this year, uh, based on our 2025 plan and extending the green, they came up with what I thought was a very creative program, and it's something that the stormwater fee can be spent on. David, you want to talk a little bit, very quickly, about creek cleanup? Yeah, we've added a, a small crew, and we're going to target areas along the creek where we think would make good access for pedestrians and along trails. We're going to go in and clean those up clean out some of the underbrush, pick up all the litter, and just make it accessible. Because there's parts of the creek that are really scenic, but they're kind of covered by a wall of vegetation. Yeah, yeah. And you really risk your life if you go in there to see that. So we're going to open up those areas in the coming years. Wow. That's an example of the type of projects that can be uh, paid for through your stormwater. Oh, that's as well as your traditional drainage projects. And David's got the other day that <laughs> and you can't say David S. either. Just <laughs> they're both David S's. So. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, the stormwater fee in a nutshell. Um, a couple other funds that we made because we're talking police and fire um, facilities. You may think, well, didn't we just do a, a sales tax for those? Which in fact we did in November of 2011. Each one is an eighth of one percent on the sales tax. They cannot be used to issue debt, so that's not an option. But even if they could, they wouldn't really be an option because in the crime control fund, we actually fund 31 positions out of that fund and a multitude of equipment. So right now, at the end of the year, your fund balance is only estimated to be a million, a little less than a million dollars. So that's not going to get you a lot of capital projects out there. The fire services district funds an additional ambulance for the city and nine firefighter paramedics. Mm -hmm. It's also purchased a ladder truck, which if y'all aren't aware, those are about a million dollar pieces mm -hmm. of equipment. So those are huge. And the main thing though that they're doing is accumulating funds for a future firehouse, um, number eight. And so what we're doing is setting aside money right now to use this to pay for one of the infrastructure improvements in the fire department. Right now, we're estimating to have 2.7 million at the end of this fiscal year, and that'll then continue to be accumulated for the next two years until we have enough to fund the fire station and all the people that will be associated with that fire station once we build it. Where will it, where where will this be, or where is it? It's being castle. Um, actually, what we just annexed in is human oh, okay. property. Okay. Uh, right up in here. It was going to be up here. Uh, we actually had land that was given to us um, uh, in, in the Austin Ranch area, uh, but the fire chief felt like if we were able to move it closer over here off of Josie, it would be uh, in a better service area response time for this new, this new challenge of serving East Louisville. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's a, a really new change. It's going to council Monday night, I think, on, yeah. on some of that plan. So. Yeah. so when it's time to build number eight, it'll be paid for entirety as well as money in advance to pay for the staffing of this project. That's correct. Wow. And that's all through the... the rate, eighth of the... the okay. All through yeah. your sales tax. All right. <coughs> and that doesn't meet all the needs of the fire department. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that, is, that does not meet all the needs of the fire department. 
the fire chief will talk to you about is the fact that station uh, Central Station, which is located off of Valley Parkway, mm -hmm. is an older facility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's going to be looking at trying to uh, build a new Central Fire Station. Oh, that'd be nice. Also, uh, because of the shifts in population, um, he would like to move Station 3. So it would be a rebuild of Station 3. Where's Station 3? Um, station 3, Steve, you want to point it's to? It's Corporate and 121 Business. Okay. Oh, we're yeah. budget suites and engines. Oh, yeah. Budget oh, and oh, It's all enough of that. Yeah, yeah. we need a police station. Where am I at? And he'd want to move it. So, again, when you look at where you put a fire station, it's all based on response times. That's right. Yeah. And as your population grows and, and moves and changes, sometimes you have to relocate the station. Yeah. The one on Valley would just be a be central. It would. He would just. He wants to rebuild there. It would be at the same location. Oh, so yeah. if you move one, what do you do with the old oh. one? That's always an interesting question, Amanda. All the other departments start buying for uh, <laughs> <laughs> expansion. Yeah. Well, the one at corporate over there, where that one's moved, that would be a great. Annex Police Department, right over that budget suites and income suites. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I need to put one right <laughs> there. <laughs> I, I do want to put these funds in perspective because each of these funds for the fire services and the crime control annually brings in about two and a half million dollars. Just the police department general fund budget is twenty million dollars. The fire services is sixteen million. So this is like a little bit of icing on the cake, but it, it's not the cake, yeah. you know. So, mm -hmm. so we're doing what we can to fund additional services for police and fire out of these, but it by no means is the bulk of. A little the more like glaze on the cake, yeah. not necessarily <laughs> icing. Yeah. So that was really just to show you that those really aren't an option for you when we start to talk about police and fire. Okay. Not, to, not to further complicate, but we actually did sign an agreement with uh, the water districts. Uh, for what's called the strategic partnership agreement and that agreement actually allows the city to collect sales tax in Castle Hills. We do collect the city's 1% sales tax and we also collect the 4B sales tax, that quarter cent. Uh, the Attorney General's office, excuse me, the Comptroller's office came back and told us we could not collect the Crime Control and Fire Control and we have not been able to grasp that and we're looking at potentially some legislative changes this session to allow us to do that. Okay, so those are those funds. I think we're getting towards the end here, I promise. Um, hotel motel tax. Tourism funding comes from hotel motel occupancy tax. 6% is um, paid to the state and 7% to the city. State law defines a tourist as an individual who travels from the individual's residence to a different municipality, county, state, or country for pleasure, recreation, education, or culture. And I give you that definition because state law is very specific about what we can use the tumultual tax for. Mm. We can spend the money to promote tourism and the convention and hotel industry. Basically, it has to fall into one of the categories you see on this PowerPoint slide. Convention centers or visitor centers, convention registration services, advertising of tourism and conventions, support of the arts, which is a maximum of 15%. And right now, this fiscal year is the first time the council has funded 15% max for the arts. And they, they did that specifically to start setting aside funding for arts acquisitions with what we had left over after we funded all of our arts groups. So. So and could a new lake development project slash convention center all of a sudden open that up for use? Like if you were to, the new development that could possibly happen out of the lake, and if you were to make that the convention center, is that yeah, where if you it could was a, a visitor, hotel, motel a hotel tax to be able to use it because you tacked that onto it? Can, you know, that's always a, an issue you have to be very conscious of because remember who's paying that hotel motel tax, other hoteliers. Now you're going to use a build a convention center that's going to compete with uh, the existing convention center. Right. But yes, to answer your question, yes, you can use it for convention center purposes as well as your CDB staff if you were to build offices for your CDB staff. Okay. But we couldn't use it to go out and solicit another hotel to come in and build it. That would have to come from. Could, if your hoteliers mind. Yeah. 
question mm -hmm. you, but you I, I know of another city that asked the Attorney General, they, they told us we couldn't do that. To, to go ahead and solicit a hotel? Not with those funds, because they're only for tourists, and so it's not directly affecting tourists, because tourists don't care whether you're going out and soliciting. So you couldn't go to, like, um, to a convention to go solicit another hotel company. Using hotel tax funds, you would have to use, you could use economic development dollars. You're Those correct. Companies. You can use it for sales purposes correct. to bring conventions to your city, but not another hotel. I would agree. On the support of the arts, is that only physical things, or can it be used for fun performances? It can be used for performances. They're still going to draw in the crowd from we found the arts groups, mm -hmm. theater, ballet, that's all. Wait, I think we found 178,000 for performances. Okay. Does that cover physical public art? It, it can. It can. It can. Yes. Okay. So if you were to wish to add public art, uh, some cities have a public art policy, and they say 1% of a project is spent on public art. So you build an animal shelter, and 1% of cost. Like the four and a half million, 1% yeah, of that would could go be. to build, add public art to that particular project. Didn't we do that? With that happen. sculpture, okay, did that not that happen? That did not happen. That did not happen. You're talking about slipper shots? Uh -huh. Slipper shots, uh -huh. He's not alone, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's, He's leaving. leaving. He's leaving. Did somebody buy him? Mm -hmm. They're just pulling Oh, did someone buy him? I don't yeah. know the answer to He's that. Right He's riding off. That's right. He's riding off. He's riding off. He's riding off. So the council sunset. did not support that way of you. Oh, they didn't. Interesting. They really okay. didn't have a way to do it. Yeah, they did. There's, yep. some, there's, there's various issues there. They could have, uh, and there's some questions on whether you could use hotel motel fund balance for that. Like that was a potential. All of the general funds are going to have to be but the public art. And that's going to be a, that's a council decision. I mean, you have to always be careful with that because even funding with the arts and sculptures, because if the hoteliers made an argument to the Texas Hotel, um, Lodging Association, Scott Joslow, Joslow's your president, and, and they said, how is this contributing to bringing tourists into the community, this art piece? And they can come back to the city and say, you have to demonstrate to me how Sweeter Slide's bringing. Oh, I can tell you right now, every time I step out my back door, cars are pulled over and stopped, and they've got their pictures, pictures. Yeah. Yeah. and their family yeah. out in front of it, taking yeah. pictures. But it's they, they every restaurant the, but they that you walk into is, that has land. Well, that's debatable. Marks. That's debatable. <laughs> you know, yeah, one of our next slides, this just to mention historical yeah. preservation too is also an area that hotel motel tax can be used on. Mm -hmm. But this next slide, you know, we do have on there that we're currently researching quite a bit in terms of what hotel motel can actually be used for in terms of debt issuances as well as arts funding. There are some specifically worded weirdness in the statute <laughs> that really can deal with location in the region and sizes of bond cells and you know if you're meeting all these so it's not quite as cut and dried as most of our funds are so we will be researching that further and as we get further in if you do see a project that you would like to look at this as a source for we certainly will look at that and research it more fully but right now um, we're not 100 percent sure if we could use it or not if you brought up a specific project so we'd have to look at it on a case by case i think it would be useful could you bring us some information to educate us on the two-part test mm -hmm. for using hot funds. Sure. I think it would be important because it's not just obvious meeting <laughs> one threshold. There's two thresholds that we have to meet that the legislators put in place. So even, for instance, if you're doing it for historical preservation, you still want to bring in heads and beds. You can't just go out and do something that's not going to have anything to do with tourism. That's what he's talking about. You kind of have to try and meet both aspects of the law, but we can bring that back to you. Um, the, the thing about hotel motel tax is that it generates $2 million approximately a year. We're anticipating our fund balance to be at $4.2 million at the end of this fiscal year. 
And then we also have a $2 million repayment coming from the Hilton Garden Inn in December of 2016 that you can also factor into any type of analysis on cash in this fund because um, we're pretty confident they're going to do that. They had another payment that they did make recently, and so they're on schedule to do that. And everything looks like that's um, going to happen. So. so we think somewhere December 16th, maybe $6.2 million? Correct. Right. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, the funding sources recap here that kind of talks about everything Brenda and I both talked about. Your geo bonds with scenarios um, leaving the debt as is or the one cent increase. So this kind of just will be your go-to sheet if you're kind of going back and forth about what we can use and what we can't. General fund cash could be used again for land primarily is what we would recommend. Your 4B funding, if you look at cash and credit, would be about $38 million. We really don't have anything in the Old Town Tax Increment Fund. Um, the stormwater fee could be between 29 and 33 million. <coughs> Crime control and fire services really don't have anything available. And then your hotel motel cash again could be around six million dollars in December of 2016. And the very last slide, I promise, is um, we wanted to talk to you a little bit just about our annual investment in our infrastructure. I think Krista had had a couple of questions before about what do we do, um, how do we know the condition of all of our infrastructure, and we do have the pavement condition index that I think David will go over with you at some point. But we also have an annual investment that we fund out of the general fund. And um, this is our 1415 investment, and it's just under $4 million. And that's annually, so you can see where every year we're looking at the streets that are in the major conditions that we need to address. We have concrete street rehabs, asphalt, sidewalk maintenance, screening walls, neighborhood rehab, alley rehab, traffic system improvements. And this year we specifically set aside funding for a railroad street repair <coughs> from Hebron to DFW landfill. And so these are things that we'll annually invest. Um, right now we have about $95 million in our capital improvement program for streets, drainage, parks projects and that's what we're working right now every day you know our staff is out there working on projects so just so that you know in addition to what you're looking at we have an annual investment in our infrastructure and we have capital projects 40 million of which are related to corporate drive that in and of itself it's a huge project that we're working on so we just wanted you to be aware of the annual impact that we have on our infrastructure as well so the sidewalk maintenance that you have maintenance on, or ADA, that you're bringing everything up to code, where what fund is that coming from right now? How are you funding that? That's this, this is, number I see right here. And that goes into our capital improvement fund where we may have some money from a prior year that we're adding to it to you know get a full project done. So you might have, like at any one time, we might have more money than this in our capital improvement program. But this is our annual investment of what we're putting over there to help address okay. all of those issues. For example, with the no secures, the uh, enhancements we made to trails, existing trails for ADA compliance, mm -hmm. a lot of that's going to be cool. Okay. Is that because it's ADA and that's where you pull from there? Okay. For parks and trails, you know, ADA, everything else would have to come somewhere other than 4B because that's only for Right. Okay. When we get to looking at roads, are, will we have a I guess a breakdown of cost to do concrete or asphalt yeah. um, because concrete is lasts longer but it's noisier and asphalt needs more maintenance but it's quieter. Um, David will talk to you specifically about that. Did you said quieter? We have on that? Asphalt is then concrete. concrete to drive on. We'll have options for you on concrete and street as well as some green initiatives. You know, we want to talk a little bit on all of our projects about how green do we want to go. You know, that's always an option too. So you're going to see for any one project, you could have various options for that. So next week, uh, you're going to have uh, the two Davids here, and they're going to be talking about uh, the thoroughfare plan, uh, the existing thoroughfare plan, and where we are as far as existing streets uh, and uh, the implementation plan in general. David Stocks is going to talk about the assessment rating system that we've used on our streets. And once you have that basis of information, uh, then we'll start going into specific uh, uh, 
recommendations related to streets. And we'll probably spend a couple of weeks on that, two or three weeks on that. Uh, then we'll shift gears to trails, and then we'll shift gears to facilities. Okay. You right will not, I have an apology to the committee. I am going to be out of town for the next two meetings. Um, and so my staff, though, will be here in full to support you. And uh, again, as we go through this process, any questions you have, um, you know, call any any of us in the room. I think you call all of our phone numbers, and we're glad to respond to, to any of your questions you have. And Ray, I believe that's what we're going to be. Well, before we close, I would say I'm glad you're taking some time off. It's, been a, a fun last few months. Um, <laughs> and with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed the light sign. We're adjourned. Thank you. Donna. Dinner. When, when I'll, I'll be out of town next yeah. Thursday. So when are these fuel? They are fuel and fuel. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was technically not going to be a business expo and bar. It's going to be a business expo. We had probably uh, about a thousand people from Really? Oh, okay. Okay. Every every week. Every time I went, I bought that. Some week or something.